good afternoon so uh, we have come to the end of the semester's journey which we began in july we started right from <coughs> probability theory and went on to explore various major classes of estimation problems and in the last class we have also seen that there are many other types of estimation problems which exist. So this class is to reflect back on what we did throughout the semester and review some of the co major concepts that we learnt and then say goodbye for the examination. <coughs> Let us review what we said in the first class. In the first class we tried to begin with a definition of what is estimation and we said that uh, we want to estimation is a kind of you know approximate calculation or uh, of what of estimation in the in I refer to a dictionary and said that if uh, said that uh, estimation is ref, uh, mentioned in the dictionary as approximate calculation or judgment based on available evidence. So here when we talk about estimation we are talking we are trying to calculate what we are trying to calculate signals or we are trying to calculate systems that is why the course is called estimation of signals and systems. So <coughs> and we want to compute our we want to we want to compute approximations of the signals. So we are trying to leave out certain things. So what are we trying to leave out? We are trying to leave out the noise in in most cases. And if you talk about judgment, what judgment are we making? We are making we are trying to generate from from the information which is given to us in the form of measurements. We are trying to judge and generate several other types of information in the sense that we are trying to predict, we are trying to find information what we can say about what is very likely to happen in the future or we are trying to detect, we are trying to see that whether in some signal we are uh, suppose we are given a signal which is which, which is mixed with another signal whether we can detect whether this whether a signal that we are looking for is present. We are trying to classify signals in the sense that we are trying to see whether certain properties of the signal are present or not and all this we are achieving through computation. We are, we are also sometimes you know sometimes we cannot measure the exact signal which we are looking for. So we are trying to see whether, whether through computation we can uh, get back the get back the original signal. So we in other words we are trying to compute some desirable information based on available evidence which may contain various unknown, uncertain, sometimes undesirable elements which we typically refer to as noise. And why do we estimate signals and systems? We estimate signals because sometimes measurement is not feasible and or it is noisy or we want or the measurement is simply not available because we are trying to talk about the future. We estimate systems which are typically dynamic and complex and all this as we shall as we have seen in the course that all this we are doing using models. So, so this is what we said when we opened the course about estimation. At the end of the course we can probably say much more many more things. So I tried to look at estimation from various ways you know. First of all remember that what are we, what are we essentially trying to do in estimation? Essentially we are trying to uh, get compute values of signals. So in that sense it is like a sensor. What does a sensor do? Let us say let us take a thermocouple or an RTD. 
if you if you put it in the process it gives you the value of a quantity called the temperature right so such devices we call sensors now here also we are we are we are trying to sense various quantities for example from from we have seen that from radar measurements we can i mean from radar me, uh, measurements of position we are trying to estimate acceleration so in that sense in that context the kalman filter becomes a, becomes a sensor for acceleration right so so we are not having any physical sensor here we are having different types of physical sensors but we are trying to essentially sense a variable how we are sensing the variable by using in this case kinematic models right so, so that's why in a in a sense for a large number of applications estimation is nothing but model based sensing why do we want to sense why do we want to sense something in many cases obviously when we are trying to sense we are trying to get some information from the system why do we want that information because because we want to take action right so obviously we don't take action open loop or in a predetermined fashion but in many situations we take action which is based on the current behavior of the system so so we so to be able to generate meaningful action we need feedback from the system that we are trying to control or we, we are trying to operate right so in that sense estimation gives us feedback but it gives feedback which is much beyond conventional sensing i mean as we have seen uh, for example we have suppose we are trying to uh, we are trying to probably you have seen the case of a tool condition monitoring case that is we we wanted to find out we wanted to sense to what extent a particular machine tool has worn out during its operation why do we want to know that because we want to decide when we have to change the tool so that our performance of manufacturing is not sacrificed now for that we need feedback from the tool and we need this feedback while the tool is working so we have seen that to get this feedback we have to uh, we can we can employ estimation and in that sense the i mean without having any conventional uh, we are sensor we are able to give a feedback for for the for this uh, supervisory action to the operator by which we can decide when to change the tool right so in that sense it estimation lets you give feedback much beyond conventional sensing can estimation is also a uh, for a large number of cases estimation is actually a classification problem for for decision for example we have seen the case of uh, fault detection diagnosis what essentially are we trying to do we are looking at the signals and using estimation techniques we are essentially trying to classify the dynamic behavior of the system into one of two classes either normal or fault right so perhaps if we can get this decision we can we can we can take very fruitful action in the sense that we can if we find that the uh, process is has developed a fault perhaps we have to take a different course of action perhaps we have to shut down the plant we have to we have to, to do many things so to be able to do all that first of all looking at the input output behavior we have to classify that behavior as whether it is normal or or whether it's faulty and estimation becomes a tool for that classification problem this these comments typically refer to signal estimation if we come to system system estimation we find that we are trying to estimate models and we are trying to estimate models typically model estimation as we have seen involves two things firstly it is model structure estimation or deciding on the model structure and secondly trying to decide the parameters 
of the model within that structure. Now we have we have also seen we have also uh, made comments that that a model is always an approximation of the system. So it is not always so the so the actual physical mechanisms which are at play could be could be much more complex than uh, what is really required. What, you, what is required in many cases is that we are able to predict or characterize the system signal values using some computational method. So, for that we need a model which is which is which is able to let us compute that the uh, system behavior within the operating modes that we are likely to encounter. So, for that we can without even going into the process physics in many cases we can we can we can simply adopt some mathematical model structure and try to find parameters within that model structure such that the input output behavior can be explained by that model structure. We, we really need not bother what are the physical chemical uh, phenomena associated with the process. So, so, in that sense we are trying to build we are trying to adopt we are trying to adopt a, a numerical approach to the model. So, it is true that I mean sometimes the uh, process physics and chemistry gives us important guidelines to the uh, selection of the model structure that is correct. But while it is so, it we 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 need not take we need not take uh, records to uh, physics and chemistry to be able to know a model structure. For example, there are I mean one of the one of the very popular approaches of uh, uh, signal modeling is using the neural network, and it is typically used in cases where the where the process physics and chemistry are really very complex, sometimes unknown. And therefore, uh, we we either cannot or we do not want to uh, really look into all that physics and chemistry. So what we say is that let us take a neural network which has a very flexible structure which can which can really uh, describe or capture a lot of kinds of behavior, and then try to find out that what are the parameters in that in that neural network so that my particular behavior can be faithfully modeled. So, what we are essentially doing is numerical modeling and the uh, and the big advantage that it can give us is that it can it can lead to a lot of simplicity in modeling and it can also let us uh, it can also let us talk about system behavior without knowing the process physics and chemistry and in and in various situations where the where the where modeling based on physical conditions would would indeed have been impossible. Like in the case of again coming back, uh, like in the case of tool condition monitoring. In the case of tool condition monitoring, the how the tool actually wears uh, through its interaction with the job is actually an extremely complicated procedure, and there 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 does not exist any well accepted method for uh, for actually modeling that. And there are some. Uh, a, there are some empirical model structures which again have been obtained basically through basically through estimation. So, we could see that even without knowing anything about the tool job interaction procedure and the uh, mechanics associated in it, we have been able to model it simply using a neural network. So, so, so estimation gives us a gives us a totally alternative approach to modeling which I have called here as numerical modeling. Similarly, estimation lets us in the, in the same vein. I mean, estimation lets us uh, discover patterns. You know, so using estimation, if you are given a large volume of data, various variables, their their time values, we can we can we can create a mathematical object which can very compactly represent. Which can this this uh, I mean, let us say kilobytes and uh, uh, I mean thousands and thousands of uh, different values we can very compactly encode into a numerical model structure which will be which will be good enough for our purpose in the sense that they will be able to explain each other's behavior using estimation so in that sense it is data mining where we are trying to discover patterns dynamic patterns complex dynamic patterns from large volumes of data we are also doing knowledge extraction 
So, as you can see, as we can probably reflect on at the end of the course, that this is what the techniques that we have learned throughout the semester, this is what it lets us do. It lets us, it, it basically provides a very uh, elegant tool into the uh, measuring tool, knowledge uh, gathering tool, uh, simply from observed behavior. And and, and, and that knowledge and that information we can use for a, for a host of purposes of, of decision and control. That is why this course is so important. Uh, I mean you will find that I mean especially now with, uh, with computers available everywhere, I mean computers being available in, in all machines, the role of information in optimal operation and control is is increasing and the use of estimation technology in, in all these applications is, is becoming I mean almost all pervading. So, this is what we have learnt. I thought that before going to review the course, I mean how we had actually made our journey, I, I wanted to emphasize that point that throughout this course, this is essentially we have learnt. We have learned to design and implement a tool which will give us much more condensed, useful and high level information which is available in the, in the measurements and which we can use for optimal operation. So, so that is what we have learnt during the semester. Now let us take a review, let us just slowly or rather quickly go through the once just recapitulate the journey that we undertook in the course. So, uh, we, be, we began the course in July, the first lecture was an introduction which actually introduced the, introduced the estimation problem and uh, tried to, tried to describe what in essence it is that is what we have just done again. And then we began right at the beginning that is we began at probability theory because of the fact that estimation theory typically involves basically in I mean estimation says that you can, you, can, you can gather information in the face of uncertainty and knowledge, uh, uncertainty and noise right. And typically a uh, probability theoretic approach is usually adopted for, uh, for describing these behaviors mathematically. So, we without assuming any background whatever, we uh, started right from probability theory and then went on to talk about random variables. So, these are variables which take on values and what values they will exactly take is uncertain. So, when they are uncertain, why are they uncertain? Because again, because there are, because there are certain phenomena at play, which influence the values that these variables take, which we are, which we are not interested in modeling, either we are, we are, we are, we are unable to model or we are not interested in modeling. So, therefore, we say that these variables are random. So, we cannot exactly say what values they will take. So, so we try to characterize random variables and then from random variables obviously, whenever we are, we are, we are talking about processing any signal or processing a system, we have to, we have to, uh, I mean, we have to work on them either using, uh, using various kinds of operators, right. So, first of all, we took a, we took a, static operator in the sense that we took functions of random variables and saw that if a random variable behaves in a certain way, then how do these functions behave? What are the behavior of the functions of them? We also saw that if, if there are a number of variables and each one of them behaves certain ways, then how, how does, I mean how to characterize the random behavior of the, of this collection of variables in terms of their 
uh, individual behavior. So, we so we talked about joint density and distribution of a number of random variables. Now, it turns out that we are always you know everywhere it, it, it is very convenient if we can even if we lose some accuracy it is very convenient to you know compress knowledge and I mean express some rough behavior in terms of you know one or two numbers. So, so in that sense while these variables can are, are actually uncertain and they can take uh, values over a certain range it is very convenient to uh, define one or two numbers which will roughly explain their their uh, values and behavior. So, so from that sense mean and variance are very very important quantities which 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 describe the the which describe two things the mean is called the called a called a measure of central tendency or that if you take 10 such variables or 10 such realizations of these variables then what is an average behavior. So, so in that sense mean is important because by just one number you are able to characterize a I mean all the all the realizations up to a certain accuracy and to what accuracy that depends on variance which is a measure of dispersion right. So, it says that how much does it differ from the mean. So, we so we define these two very important quantities which are used in the characterization of these uh, random variables and then we gradually graduated towards more and more complicated objects. We looked at random vectors which are you know I mean an organized collection of uh, random variables and then we looked at random processes. So, so you know random variables are single values while random processes are actually random functions as we have seen. So, from from random processes now these just like variables will be operated by functions. Similarly, functions of time will will be operated by dynamic operators. So, we have to we have to characterize that how these functions when they are when when they go when they go through various processes how their time behavior gets gets transformed by these processes this is of this is of I mean uh, great great interest to us. And essentially to keep things simple we we always consider linear uh, dynamics. So, then we came to see how these random processes behave when they are passed through linear system. So, if you are given the uh, power spectral density of the input can we calculate the, the power spectral density of the output. Because that is very important because in many cases we what we want is that we want to characterize the characterize the process. So, we characterize the process essentially in terms so we say that this is a process which which when fed with an input of this kind will produce an output of this kind. So, to be able to characterize these this phrase this kind we need to we need to characterize these random processes and the, and uh, their 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 processing through linear systems. So, we did that after that we did solve some problems on lecture 8 and <coughs> finally, we reviewed some 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 very important special topics on random processes before actually going on to an estimation problem. So, we talked about the normal or the Gaussian distribution which is which, which is very important because especially because it uh, it has certain very interesting properties when when operated through linear systems like it retains uh, its uh, Gaussian character. We also talked about white noise because uh, because white noise is in a sense you know like an I mean it is a it is a characterization which is a which is a counterpart of the impulse and it leads to considerable analytical simplicity uh, in our analysis. We also talked about ergodicity, which is a you know we we have to talk about in many cases it turns out that that uh, to be able to characterize average behavior it is very inconvenient to talk about ensemble averages because usually we do not have 
so many realizations of a process. So, we instead we often records to time averages of a single process and substitute that for ensemble averages. So, now I mean essentially when we want to do that we have to make an assumption about our Godicity. So, we so we reviewed these three concepts and summarized our studies on random processes before we uh, before we became ready for uh, handling estimation problems. In lecture 10 we again looked at some some further on uh, linear signal models especially because uh, we found that if you want to characterize uh, if you want to characterize output properties with input properties through linear signal models then there are then there are certain certain uh, certain kinds of linear signal models which will which which are very convenient which can very conveniently model a very wide class of uh, input output behavior so we looked at that and we looked at the uh, all zero all pole and pole zero models and at that point of time we we considered our first real estimation problem which is the linear mean square estimation which says that if i am given measurements of a certain quantity as a, as values which are sequenced over time then using this using a finite sequence or an infinite sequence of these values can i estimate another quantity can i do that so and if i can do that can i do it using a linear model and if i want to do it using a linear model if i only restrict to linear models what is the i mean how to obtain the the best estimator which gives me the minimum square error of estimation on an average on an average over ensembles again which means that if we do this estimation with 50 100 200 different uh, signal sequences and get corresponding error sequences and compute square errors and and average them which is the value of this estimator what are the parameters of this estimator which is going to give me the least mean square estimate mean square error so that is the minimum mean square error problem which is which is well known and which essentially reduces to a, a winner filtering problem and we obtain a solution of that using the so called normal equation at this point we you know in many cases it happens that we want to use uh, frequency domain uh, information we want to do frequency domain modeling because of the fact that uh, various uh, I mean complex differential equation uh, properties uh, in the time domain become 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 algebraic so that the manipulation becomes much user in the frequency domain. So, it turns out that we we need to understand how to estimate what are known as autocorrelations and then take the autocorrelation in the frequency domain to get the power spectrum. So, we need needed to study how to estimate autocorrelations and power spectrums and then obtain frequency domain models of systems in terms of the power spectrum of inputs and the power spectrum of outputs. And it turns out that uh, under certain very rather mild conditions uh, a lot of power spectra can be actually modeled using uh, linear pole zero models. So, with that we studied the autocorrelation and, and power spectrum estimation we studied two approaches uh, one based on smoothing another based on ensemble averaging and we found out also nicely that if we are given a sequence then these two approaches are, are, are roughly equivalent in the sense that they, they, they lead to the same kind of you know loss of uh, frequency domain or time domain accuracies. So now we are we are we are we are ready to explore models in the frequency domain and since we are mostly working in 
using uh, in the discrete time framework where we have rather than having a signal we have a sequence of uh, sample values. So, the frequency domain description of systems in the sample domain is the is a z transform. So, we recapitulated the z transform and we also recapitulated some a basic concept of algebra relating uh, eigenvalues and eigenvectors which becomes uh, useful in uh, in many kinds of analysis of stability innovations etc that was lecture 13 and in lecture 14 once we have understood our eigenvalue eigenvector concepts and how they can be used to you know orthogonalize a sequence we introduce the concept of innovation the concept of innovation is, is very interesting in the sense that it, 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 it transforms the information which is contained in a sequence of data values into a form where the, where the, the information is, is not really spread on, spread on each, each data sample. That is each data sample brings in new information. The, 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 the sum total of information remain the same as the, as the old sequence, but the, but now this, this, this transform sequence, which we sometimes call it, call an innovation sequence, every component of that sequence or every sample of that sequence brings in new information. So, that information which is not obtainable from that of any other sequence. So, this, you know, kind of, you know, compartmentalizes the, the, the information and again lets us do analysis in a, in a much more deep and effective manner. And then we saw that how this, what is this innovation in the context of the uh, linear minimum mean square uh, uh, estimation which we have already studied and found that the, the, the optimal minimum mean square, I mean the minimum, minimum mean square estimation actually leads to the, the error being perpendicular to the data. So, in the, in the sense that it becomes orthogonalized and each of these errors actually bring us new information which we need to incorporate while we are, while we are uh, updating our parameter coefficients. Coming from linear mean square estimation which actually you know linear mean square estimation is in a sense optimal over all possible data sequences true because it uh, because it uh, minimizes the error over 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 an ensemble average that is correct but at the same time as we have seen it requires knowledge it requires knowledge of the properties of the ensemble which may or may not be available so when it is not available when it is not available what 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 we can do is we can say that okay i do not have the data available for the whole ensemble but at least can I, can I obtain, can I obtain the, the best data which is best for this data sequence. So, if we are trying to optimize the error over the whole ensemble, we have minimum mean square estimation. If we are trying to optimize the error only, only for the given sequence, then we are doing least square estimation, which are, which are really very, you know, related. So, we saw that how far uh, you know we initially we actually uh, talked uh, about the linear mean uh, minimum mean square minimum uh, mean square estimation in the context of FIR models or all zero models. Uh, then we saw that how we can uh, how we can estimate optimum uh, optimal uh, IIR models and we saw that that actually employs uh, the concept of innovations, the uh, concept of pre-whitening and a lot of other things. Having described fixed filters, I mean how to, how to estimate fi fixed filters, we went to tackle a new situation where the properties of the data may be changing over time. In which case, if we um, employ a fixed estimator, as soon as the properties of the data change, that estimator does not remain optimal. In the, so, in this sense, actually we cannot uh, really compute a linear minimum mean square estimator because the, because the uh, matrix R and D, that is the cross covariance and the cross and the auto covariance matrices, they actually do not exist because the, because the data is non-stationary. 
So if we have non-stationary or quasi-stationary data where the where the where, where these ensemble properties are slowly changing, we need to we need to also keep our filters not fixed but slowly adapting with the with the with the data properties. So to do that, you need adaptive filters. So, so essentially what you try to do as we have seen is that you try to compute these properties, these uh, ensemble average properties online from the data that you have available and we looked at two, two different, uh, we took at two different approaches. One is the uh, steepest descent approach and the other is the uh, least mean square algorithm. So far we have been talking about uh, what is known as input output model in the sense that we uh, assume that the measurements are the inputs to our filter and the quantity that we want to estimate is the, uh, is the output. But there are lots of situations where the for the process that we are trying to estimate we have some measurements. Now we want to estimate other quantities like like a state you know we, we for example we get again coming back to that target tracking example which we did we are trying we are getting measurements only of position. So in that sense since we are getting measurements of position position is an output but we are interested in in knowing not only an accurate value of the position but also of the of the other states of the system that is the acceleration and the velocity. So, so from, uh, from a set of measurements which are actually a, you know, a combined expression of the states, we want to get the states. This is a, this, this is a very common problem and a, and a very, very important problem for a, for a large class of uh, dynamic filtering cases and we, we took that problem up and, and <clears throat> after describing the basic rules of state estimation in a, in, a, in, a, in a deterministic framework, we looked at the Kalman filter, which is an optimal linear estimator under certain assumptions for a stochastic version of that state estimation problem. That is when we have when we have uncertainty in the process input in the sense that we do not really know what, what, what the process inputs are. So, we assume that the process is being excited by some random signal and we also have uncertainties in, in the measurements. So, in the presence of these uncertainties, how to obtain an optimal estimate of the system state is the problem of Kalman filtering. This is a very, very uh, well used and well known algorithm. So, we look at it in great detail and derive the Kalman filter over two classes lecture 18 and 19 and finally derive the Kalman filter equations from, 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 from the basics from the basic uh, least square optimization uh, viewpoint. We adopted that viewpoint because there are I mean actually as it turns out that the as has been mentioned in the class also that the Kalman filter can be derived in various ways under various assumptions. So, we found that uh, the least square uh, the least square optimization viewpoint is you know one of the easiest to understand because it does not assume any make uh, does not make too much assumptions about the noise statistics and at the same time does not require a lot of knowledge about uh, probabilistic de uh, descriptions of signals. Having derived the Kalman filter, we looked at its properties, namely its namely two properties. First property was that again some algebraic orthogonality properties. That is the the again the estimation error is orthogonal to the measurement sequence as well as to the estimate sequence. So so in that sense, uh, it is we have been able to in that sense once once when the 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 estimation error is actually orthogonal to the state estimate sequence then it turns out that we cannot extract any further information from the measurement sequence to to improve our estimate so in that sense the 
the estimate becomes optimal. So we so we looked at that property and we also looked at a very nice you know a very nice probabilistic property which says that under certain uh, Gaussianness assumptions of the noise, the Kalman filter is actually a conditional mean that is given the measurements that estimate is the best best estimate. So, we also looked at this probabilistic property of the estimator. Now, if you put the first of all there are we this is the this is the basic Kalman filter property which have, which has many assumptions in it and so, so necessarily we have to take a look at how we can you know relax some of these assumptions because in a in a in a in a, in a real situation if you want to employ the Kalman filter we uh, I mean our 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 context may not really satisfy all these uh, uh, all these assumptions that the Kalman filter needs. So, in that case we need to really uh, make you know little, little modifications to the filter and we looked at two cases one is that the uh, is that the measurement noise is is colored and second that the process noise and the measurement noise are correlated. So, we saw I mean very simple methods by which these two cases can be tackled and we also took, took a look at what happens to the Kalman filter in the steady state or when does it become a, become a time invariant filter because that that is very interesting because uh, mainly because of the fact that we are we are we are firstly we are in many cases interested to understand steady state properties properties which hold for long periods of time and also because once we have a time invariant filter it becomes so easy to analyze control loops if you have a if you have a Kalman filter as 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 I have told just now that an estimator provides feedback for what for for control or for guidance in aerospace. So, so, so here basically it constitutes the feedback transfer functions you know when you when you when you feedback <coughs> you actually feedback through, through some transfer function which is typically referred to as HS. So, the so the estimator stands in that box which is the HS. Now, if it is a time invariant filter then it is so much easier to to analyze the behavior of the whole control loop and so it is interesting to know under what conditions the Kalman filter becomes time invariant. So, we looked at that and finally, we came to some applications we in detail we looked at a we looked at a target tracking case and we found out indeed that the that the that the Kalman filter can indeed remove a lot of noise. In fact, what was very impressive in our class to see that if we did not have the Kalman filter and if we had a noisy uh, process uh, uh, I mean noisy position measurement as we as we had and we tried to differentiate that to get velocity and acceleration it would have been completely hopeless. So, that shows uh, how cleverly the uh, Kalman filter algorithm has been designed because it gives us a pretty good estimate of the uh, velocity and acceleration and it has been widely used in, in, in many many applications one of the most important applications being, being the aerospace uh, systems. We looked at the various computational issues issues where <coughs> issues where numerical uh, problems can actually degrade performance we looked at the square root filter and uh, we also looked at other variants of the Kalman filter like the like the extended Kalman filter which is useful uh, for nonlinear systems or for simultaneous state and parameter estimation where where the parameters of the system are, are simultaneously changing and we want to we want to estimate the parameters as we estimate the states. At this point we so we have seen two important classes of signal estimation one based on input output models and the other based on state space models. At this point we we, we concentrated towards the towards system, system estimation which is the which is the, which is the second major component of our course. So, we first described some 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 basic introductory concepts like 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 you know realizing that the that the that the model is after all an, 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 an approximation of the system which only remains valid under you know certain operating conditions certain kinds of inputs that you give and for certain purpose. 
So, and we also describe the setting of the uh, of the of the system identification problem. That is, you have you have a set of input output data. You have sometimes you have a model structure given, and you have you, you have a model structure given, and you also have a performance criterion given, and you want to find out the the best model within which fits that model structure. That's called a model set, and we 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 want to find out the best parameters. For the for the model within that set. So again, we 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 began with the simplest possible model structure that's called linear regression model. I mean, actually, a lot of lot of systems actually uh, fit this model structure, and it has been widely widely used in uh, in various kinds of systems and control. And then we looked at a very simple and well used. Uh, algorithm called the recursive least squares. Now, the recursive least square algorithm uh, works in the base case, but there are a number of cases where you would like to, uh, where you know, several variants of the algorithm uh, can really improve performance. So, we considered some uh, some uh, variations in the in the in the basic least square algorithm in the sense that we considered exponential forgetting. Exponential forgetting lets us uh, lets us you know keep this it uh, rather than finding a model which is good good equally good over the whole time horizon. If we feel that the that the system is slowly time varying, then it makes sense to say that the parameter estimates which are being obtained now should best explain the data in the recent past and need not explain the old data to that a, to to that good an extent so in that can, case we are we are what we are essentially saying is that i i need to put more emphasis on the signals which are of recent past and need to explain them better and can perhaps ignore the uh, distant past signals to to be able to make a compromise so that is achieved by exponential forgetting Sometimes we would require that some some parameters. Suppose we are interested in uh, suppose we are interested in the uh, DC gains. So we say that we want to we want to estimate the low frequency properties of the system very accurately, and we can perhaps sacrifice the high frequency properties to an extent. In which case you have to have you know you have to have weighted variations of the least square. Then. One of the one, one of the problems of the basic least square algorithm is that it gives what is known as parameter bias, in the sense that even if the even if the model structure is the same as that of the system, because the noise is actually correlated with the data, you are if you if you if you simulate the data using even even if you simulate the data in a in a computer and then use the exact same model structure, you will not get back the parameters which you use for simulation. So, so you are going to get a parameter bias, and this essentially occurs because the noise is gets correlated with the measurement. So there are there are, there are again various ways of you know tackling that. One one approach is to is to is to model the noise, which is you know very similar to the case of the case of the correlated uh, measurement noise case. We uh, uh, that we saw in the Kalman filter in the sense that you have to then once once the once you find that the noise is actually correlated, you have to model that that how this correlated noise was actually generated. So you have to model the noise generating mechanism and you know a, enhance the uh, in, I mean augment your model structure with this noise model and then go on estimating both the system parameters, system model parameters, and the noise model parameters. There is there is another very elegant approach to to uh, remove bias, and that is the method of instrumental variables, where uh, you actually use a signal. Uh, I mean, in, in certain places, rather than using the measurement vector, you use a vector which is which we call the instrumental variable vector, and which I mean it has the property that it is very well correlated with the measurement, but it is highly uncorrelated with the noise. So so we are actually taking two approaches in one case we are trying to including the noise model we are trying to whiten the noise in the other case using we, we rather than using the actual data or the actual measurements which are correlated with the noise 
we are using a slightly different data so that it remains it becomes uncorrelated with the noise i mean the advantage is that you don't have to use a noise model but then the disadvantage is that you have to you have to again compute this this you know so called instrumental variables so you know you i mean if you want to get something you always lose something it's very difficult i mean it usually does not happen that to be able to i mean you get something without sacrificing anything else then we looked at you know some uh, some special topics on least square estimation number 1 is the is the condition of convergence that's when is it guaranteed that the least square algorithm will converge we looked at how we can identify a system in closed loop because it, it because it may not be always possible because there, there are certain problems that occur in closed loop in the sense that the typically in a closed loop the noise tends to get uh, correlated with the measurements because the because the inputs are being generated from the output so the output noise creeps into the input and there are in certain cases if you have very if you use very simple controllers then you can uh, get into what is known as a loss of identifiability if you use closed loop identification and then we looked at various you know practical identification strategies finally we looked at model order selection and that that is how do we know what models i mean you know the, the least square algorithm typically assumes a model structure so we saw how we can select model structures essentially iteratively and also by looking at certain uh, structural algebraic properties of certain data matrices like you know uh, correlation matrices and i mean examining their ranks we also can look at the residual because we know that if our parameter estimates are going to be good and Uh, under the model structure then the then the residuals will have certain properties of whiteness so if if after long estimations that whiteness does not come then we can perhaps infer that there is something wrong with the model structure itself go back and change the model structure and then again go through the go through the estimation process and again check the residuals so again it's an iterative process finally we saw that how suppose we are actually given a situation where we have we have a practical system and we have to you know connect wires and you have to get the data maybe using data acquisition cards and actually write a code and do system identification what are the various steps what are the various issues that we have to go through before we can get a model which will be good enough for our purpose so we looked at the practical issues in identification so this you know kind of completed what we wanted to complete in our course and as i have told you always that it is it is very important to know in a course i, I mean especially towards the end of the course as to what we have not learned because it because it it will always turn out that you have any course in, in any area you cannot learn everything in that area so it's so it's good to take a look at very brief look at many other things which we did not get time to look at you know in detail so in the last lecture we looked at some other some other estimation problems which we did not really see in depth for example we looked at the fault detection and diagnosis problem which is very important uh, especially for some safety critical and uh, mission critical applications we looked at multi sensor fusion and here here it is that we looked at the tool condition monitoring example that we repeated where you know using more than one sensor and using clever estimation we can we can really construct what we can say what we can call a super sensor for which we cannot have any physical device so we can enhance the 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 individual properties of each sensor just by combining them and then using an estimator we can use forecasting forecasting lets us you know uh, uh, look at the future and probably get prepared for it take 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 preparatory actions very much used in uh, various kinds of industries stock markets electric uh, utilities and then looked at uh, higher i mean a kind of estimation which is really higher than signal and system system estimation which is learning so and that brings us to today's lecture so this is what we did in the course uh essentially i think that with what you have been told you are very well equipped to go ahead and uh tackle any estimation problem that may arise in a given engineering context so with that i would like to close the course 
it was a very pleasant experience for me uh, thank you very much